Thank you to Anna and April for um, giving me a call last night and telling me that they wanted to come down and share this with us this morning. Thank you so much. Yeah, this morning I prepared a sermon. It's called uh, Fear Versus Faith, but we just call it Storms. Right, the storms in life. You know, first off, I want to say mahalo and good morning. If this is your first time joining us, you know, we want to welcome you and you know, tell you to make yourself feel at home. Right? Our home is your home and aloha and thank you for joining us. You know, it's always great to gather together with brothers and sisters from all over the world, you know, from wherever you may be from, but it's always good to be under one roof and one spirit with one heart to worship the one true king of this world. Amen? And our God is good, right? And all the time? Amen. You know, for those of you who have been joining us for the past few weeks, we've been studying through the warm and fuzzy book of James. Right, the, the feel-good book, right? Every day you leave here after the message, you feel all warm and tingly inside, and you just want to go out there and hug everyone, right? But, you know, James is, is known for that. And, you know, thank God for books like that. You know, thank God for books that allow us to correct ourselves. Thank God for books that allow us to, to look at ourselves in a way that we should be looking at ourselves. You know, instead of looking at others and being critical about them, right? And this, of course, comes through what, what James puts out. You know, for all the believers, you know, that we got to be doers of the word and not just hearers of God's word. You know, the, the hearing part and understanding part is always the easier part than to do as our Lord has shown us. You know, some, some of us, we like to read, we like to study, you know, the wondrous word of our Lord, you know, the awesome word of our Lord. And, but now we should look at the way that we should be intimate with Him, intimate with Him and then the people all around us. You know, we all struggle with this. You know, we got to be straight up and up, up front right at the beginning that we all struggle with this in our relationship with, with Christ, in our relationship with one another. You know, it's, it's either one thing that we got going on a particular day and something else we're kind of lacking in. You know, it's never a, a day where we have everything all together. But the great part is this, is that we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same struggle. You know, no matter where we are in our workplaces, at homes, friends, families, we're all in the same boat. And today is the first day we'd like to kick off a series what we call, what we are calling genuine faith. And when we say genuine, now we're not talking about 100% pure, I got it all together kind of faith. Well, what we're saying is here is this, is that it's okay to fall. It's okay to fail. I don't have it all together, but I continue to run the race while keeping my eye on the prize. But adding this statement in there, you know, I would love to do this together with all of you. You know, that's the way that we should be. As a church, that's the mentality that we should have. As a family, as we say here in Hawaii, ohana. You know, no one's left behind, right? We get that from Lilo and Stitch. You know, thank God for cartoons, right? But that's the thing is that, you know, we don't have to be leaving anyone behind. We should be walking along together, sharing life together, breaking bread together. In the book of Acts, you know, speaking of the fellowship of the believers in Acts 2, 44, it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Yeah, I think the, mis the misconception of this, of this passage is that they had all the good stuff together, you know, which is true. They had all of that. They had the fellowship. They had the worship. They had the breaking of bread. But using an absolute word such as all means everything is included, the bad as well. And I think that they, in these times of fellowship, they actually prayed for one another in their times of weakness, their struggles. I mean, nothing's changed. Sin has always been in the world and will remain in the world until the perfecter of the world returns. And that's Jesus. And that's what we'll be observing today as well, you know, in our Lord's Supper. But, you know, having all of these things in common and being open about it, you know, does it make us any less of a person? No, it doesn't. You know, does it make us seem, you know, a little more dirty than, you know, the other person next to me. No, it doesn't. It's just realizing that it is in sin that this world, we're surrounded with it. You know, we, we think about it, we fail. You know, we look at it in the wrong way, we fail. 
you know, it's, it's a constant battle that we're going through. But in church, I just want to let you guys know that it's okay to be safe in that, to know that you can live amongst your brothers and sisters, you know, knowing without fear, without shame of the life that we've had before, you know, without worry of, oh, what are, what are they going to say about me today? No, we can forget about that. The one thing that we're called to do is what? To love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. It's simple. We complicate it a lot of times, but it's real simple. You know, this past Monday was my birthday, and, you know, Jay being the, um, the comedian that he is, he got me a, a birthday card, and on the front it says, keep it real. You know, how awesome is that, just to keep it real? You know, can we, can we keep our walk with Christ as real as it is? You know, we don't have to put up any facades, just be real. You know, and that, that card right there is direct alignment with what we'll be studying through, you know, this series, which is called Genuine Faith. You know, all of us, you know, some of us, you know, we fail, right, right in the beginning of our walk. You know, we can get up in the morning first thing and we can pray to God asking him for forgiveness for you know, what, we've did, what we've done the day before. And five minutes after stepping out the door, you know, we stub our toe and do the same thing that we just did and we prayed about and asked for forgiveness about. Right? And then some of us, we could go you know, a couple days of making it through you know, um, our walks and you know, we end up falling. And then for some of us, you know, we have long periods you know, that we, we get our lives going. We start following what the Lord commands, but then we get so good at it that we forget about the reason why the Lord had done it. You know, we forget about the heart part, you know, having the heart and the love as to why we do the things we do. It was just like, a, you know, growing up when I first learned how to ride a bike, right? You get confident. You can take off one training wheel and you graduate to two training wheels. Next thing you know, you're, you know, riding solo up and down your street. And when your mom's not around, what do you decide to do? You know, I'll take that bike, go around the block, and my friends are talking about jumping ramps, right? <laughs> you know, in that very life moment when you're paddling as fast as you can and you hit that ramp, you realize that, mm, you know, dirt doesn't taste good. <laughs> and it's definitely not as soft as it looks, so. <laughs> you know, but that's the thing. The way we interact with one another, the way that we interact with God, you know, we should have the hearts wide open, you know, and knowing that it's in Him that we find our comfort, that we find our perfection. You know, and we as a church here at Key Baptist, we all have all agreed that to keep everything as simple as possible. And that's why our, 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 our logo, and our slogan for the church is, you know, loving God, loving people, following Christ. It's as basic as there is. And, you know, there's nothing else we should be doing. Real simple. And, but today, as we kick off this series, is Genuine Faith. You'll be, we'll be reading through probably one of the most famous Sunday school stories ever. You know, it's when Jesus walks on water. So if you could open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. You know, we'll read through this passage together and, you know, gain some insight. You know, I hate to use Peter all the time, but... You know, Peter is definitely a, an example of, of someone who fails and fails and fails, but yet the Lord still uses him at the end, you know, calling him the rock. So Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Okay. If you're there, follow along with me. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water, he said. 
He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let us bow our heads. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, God, as we dive into your word this morning, Lord Father, I pray, soften our hearts and our minds, Lord Father, so that we may hear your word, Lord Father. May nothing else that comes off this pulpit be of, of me, of anybody else here, Lord Father, but of you, Father. May you receive the glory this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So one of the favorite stories of all time, right? Jesus walks on water. You know, everybody freaks out saying it's a ghost. Peter says, you know, being the brave guy he is, and he says, hey, Lord, if it is you, call me to come out. And Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat, walked around, and it says here, when he saw the wind, he became afraid. And he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. So for, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a CSI fan. How, how many of you guys are CSI fans out there? Oh, yeah. It's all about the evidence, right? Putting the picture together. You know, and it's always in these, in these types of investigations that, you know, you always try to answer the questions, right? The who, what, when, when, who, what, where, when, why, and how, excuse me. <laughs> oh, dry throat. But for today, let's, let's narrow it down. Let's just look at the um, where, who, why, and when. So first off, let's start with the location. Let's go to location. So the Sea of Galilee, you know, it's Jesus' hot spot. This is where Jesus, a majority of his ministry is taking place, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, his, his miracles along the way. You know, Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, for us, you know, some background here, it's, it's 13 miles long and about eight miles wide. So it's not a very big body of water. Cool thing about this, this lake, or this freshwater lake, it's actually the world's lowest freshwater lake and is about 680 feet below sea level, below um, the Mediterranean. So this body of water, for instance, we know that it's very low-lying and it's in between two valleys. You know, a good example of this is like Ma'alaya. You know, which is that area where the boat harbor is, where you guys catch your uh, Molokini tours and whatnot. But it's between these two valleys that when the wind gusts through, it actually picks up speed and comes across. And kind of like the Sea of Galilee here. You know, Jesus, again, like I said, he, he walked the shoreline. He rode on a boat across it many of times. And this is, you know, Jesus' you know, hangout. This is where Jesus' ministry took place. Now that we looked at location, let's look at the people. You know, the people that we're, going to, we're about to read about, or the people involved in this incident are the 12 apostles. You know, Mark 6.30, it's, it's written that the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. You know, the previous passages or previous verses, you know, Mark writes that Jesus sent out the apostles. Jesus sends out the apostles, you know, two by two on the way out. But all of them, before the feeding, just prior to the feeding, all returned to Jesus and returned and report to them what they have done. Oh, so we know that the 12 apostles were Simon, who's Peter, Andrew, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the, the Canaanian, and Judas. And we know that the people that are on the ship, four of them were fishermen, right? They, they dropped their nets and followed Jesus. So the question, why? Why did they cross the Sea of Galilee? Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody want to take a guess? It's simple, because Jesus told them to. <laughs> but the when, the when is, is where the wonders begin. In Matthew 14, 22 to 24, we read that what? The, after the feeding... Jesus immediately made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while Jesus dismissed the crowds. You know, what would cause Jesus 
to tell them to immediately get into the boat and, and just go. Don't worry about the people. I got this. Jump in the boat and go. So we read that there, you know, it was just before sunset because Jesus was praying, and then evening came. And then the disciples, when they were crossing and they got into trouble, it was about the fourth watch. So the fourth watch, we know that it's between, you know, the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So from the time that they left to the time that they actually got into trouble, you know, these men were traveling for about eight hours or so. And we understand that the width of the lake or the Sea of Galilee is only eight miles long. You know, how long does it take 12 men on a boat to go eight miles? Not eight hours. <laughs> Definitely not eight hours. But then Peter, seeing Jesus walking on the water, you know, Jesus, Peter calls out and says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out on the water. You know, how many of us, in the midst of our trials, the midst of our storms in our lives, when the winds are blowing, the waves are going crazy, would even think about going out. I mean, for some of us, you know, fear, fear in our lives, you know, will stop us in our tracks. You know, we read here that um, Peter saw the wind. You know, how many of us know what the color of the wind is? You know, what color is the wind? You know, no one can see the wind. But we understand that, you know, not everything that we fight in our lives we're able to see, right? Not everything we see in our lives is, is a physical battle, and that's what Paul talks about when he talks about the spiritual battles. You know, the spiritual battles that we fight in our lives actually affect our physical lives. You know, ask anyone who's experienced anxiousness. You know, ask someone who's experienced depression. You know, these two things will stop anyone in their lives, no matter if they're successful or not. Fear and anxiety will stop anyone cold in their tracks. You know, the sad thing about pe people who uh, suffer from an anxieties and depressions is that, you know, instead of seeking the help they need, they, they, they usually turn away. They pull back. And, you know, I personally, I know a lot of people who've, been de you know, who've dealt with anxiousness and depression. And... It's a sad thing because you take someone who's very vibrant in life, someone who's very active in life, and now just living in a life of fear that everything around them is going to kill them. You know, I have a great story to share with you guys. You know, um, just a few weeks ago, um, you know, Brother Jacob over here, you know, he's all into, um, you know, winding rope and, you know, his Hawaiian culture that went out to uh, the Twin Falls area. And, you know, me being a, you know, a police officer, I shouldn't have any fear. I shouldn't have any worries. But then dealing with certain cases and backgrounds, you know, I know of certain things that have happened in certain areas. But we go out to um, Twin Falls, and, you know, Brother Jacob says, hey, follow me. Let's go dive underneath this waterfall. And if we dive under where the water hits, it'll shoot us out. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so what you're saying is, if I go down underneath this heavy waterfall, it's not going to push me under, but it's going to shoot me out. Yeah, I did it oh, plenty of times already, plenty of times. So I'm like, okay, I trust you, man. So let's go. So we're crawling around the rocks, and as I'm going out there, I'm like, man, I'm actually afraid right now. And we got to a point where we're so close to the waterfall, I looked at him and I told him, I don't usually tell many men this, but I'm scared, bro. <laughs> But he's like, no, 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 just, just, just trust me. Here, watch, I'll, I'll show you. So he goes underneath, and sure enough, the waterfall shoots him out. I'm like, man, that's cool. But I think I'm going back right now. <laughs> but then I looked at the distance that we walked, and I'm like, oh. Okay, here we go. So he comes around again, ah, just, we go, we go, okay, we'll do it together. So sure enough, we go, and, you know, we do it, but, you know, we come shooting out the other side, and I'm like, Okay, uh, that's good. I, I did it. I can say I'm done. I scratched it off my bucket list. I'm good. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, seeing the things that, you know, that I've, I've been able to experience and, you know, it, it puts the thought in your mind that, hey, the worst can happen. But, you know, fear will stop you in your tracks from living the life and enjoying the wonders and the beauty that God has created. You know, the, the sad thing, again, is, you know, how do we 
help one another in, in times like these. Because we all have worries, right? How many of us worry about finances all the time? Yeah, right here. I'll raise my hand. You know, how many of us worry about the way we raise our children? You know, so that they grow up to be productive citizens. I'll raise my hand. You know, how many of us <laughs> worry about, you know, the, the people down the street that are always having uh, loud parties and fights and everything else? I'm always worried about them. But, you know, the thing is, is that we, we got to live life. But we also got to do life together, right? And that's why, as a church, we, we got to break down the barriers and know that it's okay to be afraid. Man, I was okay with being afraid that day. Thanks, Jacob. Are you the man? <laughs> But in the fear that, that Peter experienced at that very moment while he's on the water, you know, also destroys or distracts our relationship with the Father. You know, a lot of us in our lives, we, we have this fear of, you know, what we've done and what we've committed in the past. You know, thinking that, that God won't ever take us back. You know, another wonderful conversation that I had with one of my brothers, uh, you know, in the department, you know, it started off as work, and then all of a sudden, you know, he looks at me and he says, you know, I don't know what I'm about to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this. So he tells me the story of his sister telling him that he should, one, pray more. And he's like, what? Pray? You know I believe, right, sis? That's, that's what he told her. But you want me to pray more? How is that going to help? So the sister tells him, hey, you know, praying allows you to to confess your sins and to confess the things that you've done in the past. So, you know, we share a little bit about that and then he goes in a little deeper and he says, you know, the one thing that stops me from coming back to God is, is faith. I go, well, what do you mean? Because he goes, man, you know, we're cops, man. Cops like to see the evidence. They like to see everything in black and white. They like to see all the dots connected to go from point A to point Z, case closed. But you know what? For me, it's hard because... You know, I, I can't see him. But he goes, most of all, it's the things that I've done. I mean, we all have friends. We have all have done things in our lives, right? But I tell him this, that the God we serve, you know, he's known as the good father. You know, as fast as we are to confess our sins, right, he's quick to forgive. You know, that there's nothing that you've done in the past that he cannot forgive. You know, it reminds me of the song that we're listening to coming today. It's um, the song Clean, right? It's by, um, what is her name again? I forgot her name. But hey, look it up, Clean. And there's, there's a, a line in there. Who? Yeah. There's a line in there that says, there's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You know, and that's the wondrous God that we serve. You know, the fears of what we've done in the past should not stop us from coming to the Father. You know, the stuff that, that we worry about should never stop us to coming to the Father. You know, He's there for us. You know, God has always desired that the relationship with each and every one of us, even for those who haven't known Him as, as their Lord and Savior. You know, he's, he's been there, and that's the reason why he, he interacted the way He did with Adam in the garden. You know, our, our fears causes us to forget who is in us, who is with us always. And, you know, the disciples, for instance, you know, talking about fear, distracting the relationship with, with our Lord, that the disciples, just hours before they got onto the boat, just witnessed probably one of the biggest um, miracles, right? Feeding thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. You know, who's able to do that? Only our Lord. But Jesus promises in Matthew 28, you know, before he leaves and sends down his Holy Spirit to us, says there teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And he's telling the disciples to go out into the world to teach everyone. But at the very end, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, we got to remember that. We always have to remember that because as we've seen in that passage, that fear causes our eyes to be moved off of Jesus and onto our circumstances. When we focus on our circumstances over our Lord, you can guarantee that your flight mechanism in our lives will be triggered and we'll run as far as we can. You know, in Psalms chapter 46, verses 1 through 10, you know, it's a beautiful psalm. And I'll read that to you folks. You know, God is a refuge and strength, 
a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when her morning dawns, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease, cease to end of the earth. He breaks the ball and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, the answer to, to that, those situations is this, is to be still. You know, in times of fear, in times of battle, just be still. We got to understand that some things we can battle. But it's those wars that we fight that we can't see the enemy. There's no sense in swinging at something you can't hit, right? Be just a whole bunch of wasted energy and a waste, waste of sweat, but we understand what battles are the Lord's. You know, the word still, used in the Bible, refers to the word meaning cease. To cease. To cease the fight. So when we cease fighting the battle, it is not that we are giving up, but instead, we're about to send in the heavy artillery, right? You know, some of the combatants that were um, involved in the Middle East War back in the 90s, you know, a lot of them said that they knew that the battle was about to be over when they heard the fighter jets and planes coming in because they know that at that time that the heavy artillery was coming in. You know, our enemy, he knows that, you know, when we stop, be still, and we know that our Lord is God and we pray to him, we can guarantee that our enemy is quivering. You know, but that's the way that we need to fight our battles. You know, the enemy, he will not cease. He will not stop advancing until we send in the heavy artillery. And we got to understand that not all the battles that we fight in our lives is, our, is ours. We got to give it to God. But the key to today's message is this, is that love and faith conquers all fears. Love and faith conquers fears. But how do we gain our faith? You know, how do we grow our faith? Or how do we even become in the faith? Romans 10, 17, remember our long study through the book of Romans? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, we haven't been afforded the opportunity to walk with Christ. But through his teachings, the hearing of his word, and the Holy Spirit that's inside of us, you know, we can walk like him, you know, just as we are called to do. You know, little imitators of Christ, his disciples, you know, when we hear the word of Christ, it lays the foundation, the solid foundation that we cannot be moved. We're, you know, our steadfastness right there in our word. Every word, every teaching that the Holy Spirit brings into our hearts lays one stone in that foundation. The more we hear, the more we read, the more we learn about the love that the Father has for you and I, which is exemplified on the cross. You know, the songs that we sing every day, you know, when we come together, you know, songs of praise, songs of worship, that's what we're worshiping, the wonderful work of, of the, on the cross. You know, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 25, it says, you know, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it has been founded on the rock. You know, where, where our homes are built. Where are our homes built? You know, are we, have we built it on the solid foundation that, that we should have it on, or have we built it on, on sand? You know, we, we know the story. We know what happens when we build our house on sand. You know, storms, the floods, the winds came, and it's gone. But this faith, you know, being one with Christ, being in a relationship with Christ, helps us to overcome our fears. You know, this faith is what allows us to do the work that the Father has called us to do. It 
allows the Father to complete the work that He's doing in each and every one of our lives. You know, to work by His grace alone and not by anything that you and I have done. You know, it's ever perfecting work in our lives. You know, that casts out all fear. First John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. You know, how can we be perfected in this love that, that is written here, that John writes about, if we don't even know who we're loving or who loves us in return? You know, knowing the person that loves, knowing the person that you are called to love, and the love that you receive, that's the only way that you can be perfected in this love. You know, if you haven't experienced that love, you know, then maybe that's the reason why we're still fearful in times. You know, we feel like there's no way to turn. There's no one to turn to. But the love of the Father is what David describes in Psalms 23. You know, the shepherd that leads us to green pastures by safe and still waters, protecting us against the attacks of the wolves. You know, this is the shepherd that meets all of our needs. You know, where we are all the time. You know, we are all going to have moments, right? I mean, like I said, you know, experiencing God's creation and having fears and, and worries. You know, in times in our lives, you know, we'll have these worries pop up. You know, the other day I was listening to Living on, Living on the Edge with uh, was Chip Ingram. And he was talking about these things where he'd be praying before a message. He'd be praying, you know, with his, uh, his pastors and his some of the members from his congregation, his wife would come pray over him. And just a few moments before he would go up, you know, he would get hit with this out of nowhere, out of left field type of uh, attack. And in his mind, he's thinking to himself, he's like, wow, why am I feeling anxious? Why am I feeling fearful? You know, it's only then that he stopped using the education that he had, he says, and just started praying. He started praying to, to the Father. And in those moments, he, he remembers, you know, talking about spiritual battles again, that we always got to be battle ready. We always got to be ready for when these times come because otherwise we'll be caught off guard and we'll start to sink like our, our brother Peter here did. But, you know, for all of us that are gathered here today, and, you know, just a few moments, we'll, we'll do our Lord's Supper. But, you know, if you haven't, you know, made that decision. You know, Jesus is calling you. You got to trust in that call. When Jesus calls, you go. You know, as, as many wise people have told me, you know, when Jesus calls, you go. But if you haven't experienced that love or experienced that relationship or you feel like you have nowhere to turn, you know, the Lord is always there. You know, he's two knees away. You know, we put our knees to the ground and he's there. You know, we call out to him and he's there. He's always been there for us. And we got to remember that the love that he shared, the promises that he's given to each and every one of us is always going to be there. You know, and that's what we're going to do and take part of. So if I could have, you know, our ushers come up.